Werner, you were a long-time professor. What was the relationship between your teaching and your practice as an artist? Um, it was quite, quite uh, interactive because it, one feeds off the other. I found uh, the teaching is the vehicle where you can see what you do in some ways, you know, and, and you, you project it towards an audience of your students and uh, it, it feeds back to you in, in a very healthy way to, to see what you're doing really. Uh, and I found that always the, the, the most important part of teaching is that it, it sort of gives you a view at yourself, you know, what you're doing. And, and, uh, uh, and I found it kept me going for 40 years. <laughs> so let's, let's think of the proverbial question that people might ask an artist. So what is a work of art? Well, a work of art to me is a kind of a uh, chunk of your own conscience, subconscious, you know, that it comes out and we don't really know where it starts, but somehow I find in my own life I have the urge to project things out and I have the method of drawing and painting and sculpting and whatever it is and, and uh, that's, that's how I interpret what art is to me. You know. And to a certain extent, I mean, you're a multidisciplinary artist because you have been, as you say, a printmaker, a sculptor, a painter, but an awful lot of your life has been spent with with the material of paper and through that you have explored those various artistic forms. To what extent have they sort of worked together? Well, what I find paper is kind of a membrane that connects all the disciplines. When you think of it, I mean the architect, the sculptor, the painter, they all make notes and what do they use? Paper, you know, it's before it goes into the specific media, it is uh, used on paper, you know, you test it out. And this is the thread that connects all of them and then becomes in itself as a drawing, it's, it's, a, it's a media in itself, but as a kind of notation, as a, as a link, it, it's part of, of all the media. So like. mm. Paper has been a sort of a revolutionary medium, so we want to think right back to papyrus. Right. And we go thousands of years ago and then we think of it as a, as, a, as you say, a membrane. It's something that has various um, interpretations. I mean, you can write on it, but you can do a lot more with it. To what extent, I mean, do you see paper as a, like a multi-form? Well, when you, when you examine it carefully, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating when you know how paper is made. It's, it really is liquid when, before it becomes a solid, it's liquid. It, it's like 90% uh, water and over 99% water and in there floats this little fibers and then you separate the water and suddenly you have a solid sheet. And then you look at the sheet, it's flat, and normally, but if you turn it on its side, suddenly it can stand on its edge, and you make a couple of creases in there, and it has a structure. It becomes suddenly a dimensional thing, and you can build with it. So it's, it's a fascinating material. But it's also a, a store of memory, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, particularly when you think in terms of in, in what we have used it for, for hundreds and thousands of years to record our history, to record whatever we do, you know. And then, you know, when you talk about memory specifically, you know, the paper uh, reacts to moisture, reacts to, to stresses, you know, if you push it and pull it, and it remembers, you know, and it comes back to where it started from, you know, which is fascinating. And you know, paper has, has, a, has a, a very strong uh, kind of, I call it will of its own because of the way the fibers run, you know, if, if, you, if you go against its will, you know, it, it, it treats you badly. <laughs> so you have to accept its disciplines. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, the paper, the paper teaches you discipline, you know, and if you, if you go wrong, you know, <laughs> you have to end resolve, it doesn't work. You know? So tell me, you, you grew up in Germany and you were born in Stuttgart before the Second World War. What was your childhood like in, in Germany at that time? That was quite, quite interesting. Uh, it, um, a couple of years ago, I sat down and, and decided I should really record what I went through as a child because I, I came to this country and my I have kids and they have no clue what, went, what, what I went through. So I sat down and sort of tried to remember things. And I, and I started the earliest memories go back to my age two. And it was just at the beginning of the Second World War. And what I realized, it was kind of an unusual way of growing up. You know, there were no men. It was only women. All the men were gone. They were drafted and, and they were doing the war business. And so I grew up amongst women, you know, strong women. And, and what happened um, in the, 
early part, uh, the city of Stuttgart was singled out as an industrial center, so it was heavily bombed. And I remember the first day I was going to school, you know, there's this tradition in Europe where you have this cone with goodies and stuff, and, and they still kept going that. I went to school, sat down, the alarm went off, we had to go to the cellar, and the school was bombed. So when we came out of the cellar, there was no more school. So uh, the next day, the city decided all school-aged children had to move to the country about 40, 50 miles away from that kind of magnet of, of uh, uh, attention to, to the Allies. So I went back to my father's homestead in the Black Forest on a farm. And it was the most you know, incredible time as, as a little kid to have cows and chicken. And, and I had no idea what this all, all was all about. And it was a wonderful experience until the very end, when, when uh, the war ended, we were on the French side, you know, towards France, and, and the war literally went through our village. And we had uh, tanks out the house, machine guns shooting off. There were soldiers dying in our living room. So it was, a, was quite a, a dramatic experience, you know. And, um, you know, there were, you know, periods where you fa found uh, it was kind of be dangerous to be outside. <clears throat> I remember I was once attacked by diving planes, you know, and, and you know, strange stuff, you know. I mean, I remember that. And it was kind of fun when I sat down to, to write this up. I kept recalling events that I had forgotten, you know, and, and I, I, I'm glad I really did it, you know, to, to really have some kind of a document that I can pass on to my family. You know. mm. And was your own home in Stuttgart bombed? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that was part of the of the uh, reason why we left and, and uh, the, uh, we were almost for two years, I was never undressed. I slept in my clothes because we had to be ready at a moment's notice when the alarm goes off, you have to be running to the cellar. So one day we ran to the cellar and we were sitting there and suddenly we knocks on the door and said, get out, get out, the, the house is on fire. So the bombs had hit the house and we had no clue down there. The smoke goes up and we didn't get. So essentially uh, that was the end of our city life for about two or three years. And, and then at the end of the war, you know, we had a different story. The, the city place where we had uh, spent our first years uh, was another country. There was the American zone, and we lived in the French zone, so we needed a passport <laughs> to go from, from one part to the other one. Mm -hmm. And it was quite, quite a, uh, an unusual way of living. You know. And in terms of your growing up, I mean, you've, in your artistic career, mm -hmm. you've manifested a strong interest in literature and in sort of learning. Mm -hmm. To what extent was your household a place of learning and uh, books? Uh, it, it was and it wasn't, because I was... Uh, in interestingly enough, there were not many books around, you know, because uh, you couldn't get them, A, paper was very scarce, and, and uh, whatever was available was used for propaganda purposes. And uh, I, I was just, I remember, I was always going to a family, a neighbor's family house that had a wonderful collection of children's books. So whenever I needed solace, I went to them, and there was always a hot chocolate there, and, and I got my children's book lessons, and I got somebody reading to me, and it was, there was paradise. And that's how I sort of got to really uh, understand books as a kind of a kind of a solace, you know, that you can draw really strength from, and so. And so, books as a metaphor during that time are very loaded because, on the one hand, there was censorship, and on the other hand, there was propaganda. Yeah, you yeah. grew up with that. What impact did that have on you as a youth? Well, I think. I wasn't so much aware of the propaganda in the age five, six, seven. They, they came later, but I was uh, aware that you couldn't buy books and you couldn't, you know, uh, whatever was available was always, you know, in hindsight, I saw it was tinted, you know, by, by the influence of the government. And uh, I wasn't at that age really aware what book burning was about. You know, this comes when you're, you know, 10, 12, 14, you know, you see that. But I remember uh, I was always fascinated by the idea of books. There was one uh, volume in our house which was a kind of a history book. And I kept going forth and back and reading and going comparing and there was the wonderful wood engravings in there. So it was sort of a, a, an early lesson in printmaking was, was, was right in front of me. So after school, what did you do and why did you do it? Uh, when, when you mean... Yeah, after your, your, your school, did you go to college or no, what, what did I, you study? No, what I did is I actually uh, took an apprenticeship as a uh, typesetter, which was in, in, in a way sort of a, a door into the idea of literature and book, you know, because 
the typesetter was part of the, the production of books, you know, and, and newspapers in forms of a book. And there was a full-fledged uh, kind of profession that goes back to Gutenberg. And so I was trained for three years in this, or two years, how it was. And, and uh, you, you go one day to school and three days or four days to, to uh, shop and you do your work. And it, it made you aware of, of what goes into books. And you, you read a lot because you translate it from manuscript into a page of type. You know? and so that, that was a very good training. You know, in this. So you grew up in a sense with the, like the medieval culture of the master apprentice and oh yeah, with oh the yeah. disciplines and the rigidities that that, that contains. Sure. What impact did that have on your life and what does it mean for the way you see people growing up today? Well, I think what I found the, the, the rigidity of the discipline uh, was initially kind of difficult to deal with because you, as a young person, you try to reject all of that. But uh, I sort of couldn't escape it, so I adapted it. And I said, well, if that's how it is, I'm, I'm just might use it for my, my own purposes. And it has fe uh, done me well all my life because that, that discipline teaches you, you know, if you do something, you might as well do it right, you know, do it, do it correct. And, and uh, I think uh, at times I have questioned if we should have more discipline, but at the same time, it's probably out of line in today's environment because there weren't many distractions when I grew up, you know, there was, I, I grew up without a phone, I grew up without TV, I remember the first time I saw a TV was in a storefront and they had to test bars, you no know, gray bars, when he, the whole town was standing there watching, watching a B, TV being tested. And, and it was quite, a, quite an amazing experience, so, so there were very little distractions, it's only slowly it started coming back, you know, after two or three years after the war. When we think of today, we think of a lot of inattention because of the barrage of information that we mm -hmm. constantly get and you place that against your own career and one sees the patience that it takes and the discipline particularly when you make work mm -hmm. in uh, editions and sometimes you know up to 50 and the complexity of the individual works that's an extraordinary discipline Th tell me about your your aptitude for patience well I, I think in 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 the uh, discipline there is there's a kind of a reward because when you repeat things, you, you realize how uh, things sort of connect, you know, how, how a piece of paper or cardboard or, or a bend you make, uh, when you do it the 20th times, the 30th times, it tells you something that if you do it a little more left, or a little more right, it does something different. And there's a satisfaction by uh, sort of going through this motion, you know, rep in a repetitive way, it's like, you're, you're practicing your violin, you're, you're practicing piano, you're, you play it over and over, and finally you get the sound right. And, and I think that's, that's what I always think. There's, there's a whole um, mystery about putting things together in a, in a repeated form. Do you think anything of that was influenced by the artistic formation of the 60s and 70s, and particularly the emphasis on seriality? Mm. I, I, I was very intrigued by that, and I think definitely I was, uh, in, in fact, I was experimenting in the 70s, mid-70s, late-70s, with a system uh, which is called uh, Systemkunst, systems art, where you put pieces together and you put them out and let people complete them and, and manipulate them. And that's, in a sense, you know, working with, with uh, almost a prefab kind of concept for art, it's like what Warhol was doing with the coloring book, you know, you, you, you get a little bit out and let the people fill in. And, and that's sort of the, the uh, framework that I, I enjoyed really working in. Yeah. So after the apprenticeship, what did you do then? I went to the art school, I went to, uh, which was a, a kind of a logic, you know, because um, I, I never wanted to stay in that, in that uh, and, the, and the profession of a typesetter today is gone. You know, it's, it's been, you know, excluded by, <laughs> by the computer and by Adobe programs. <laughs> There's no more typesetting. And I went to the art school. I, I got a formal training as an artist, and which is uh, at the Kunstakademie in Stuttgart, which is basically the same type of school as the Bauhaus was. You know, you have a foundation a year, and then you go and pick a discipline and, and do your, your three or four or five years, whatever. And the, the, the lip, there was no um, kind of structure where you had to pass 
in one year. You just go there and if you feel you're ready to move to the next level and so on. So it was quite, quite uh, comfortable. Mm -hmm. In some of your earlier drawings from the, the 60s and even the 70s, there's a strong Bauhaus feel, I, I think. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the, some of the teachers I, I studied with, they had uh, either studied at the Bauhaus or had been taught by Bauhaus people. And there were still people that had Bauhaus credential walking through our halls in the school. I remember one time I met uh, uh, a guy named Baumeister. He was uh, uh, teaching at the Bauhaus in the end. And then I, I was very fascinated by, <coughs> by Dada and so on. One day, Otto Dix walks in the, in the school. It was fascinating to, to meet these people now. And the Stuttgart had been sort of quite a, a center for, for activity. You know, there was Schlemmer was a big Bauhaus man in the theater, and, and uh, uh, some Dada people came from, from the Stuttgart area. So it, it's, it's a city, uh, maybe not unlike Toledo, it's a big industrial base, and then it had cultural uh, life that was quite strong, a theater and, and uh, art school and uh, you know, ballet and Mm -hmm. opera and all this quite, mm -hmm. quite powerful. So you've spent uh, over two-thirds of your life in the United States of America. How did you come to America in 1961? What caused that? Well, there were two reasons, I think. One was I had uh, seen the history of Germany and of Europe and I had, to, I had to get out. I had to look at it from the outside because there was a necessity to really to see what, what the reality was. There was one reason. The other reason was New York was a booming, you know, time with the new art. You know, you, you just couldn't could not avoid coming across people from New York. You know? So that was the was the reason why I really decided to come here. Did uh, you intend to come for a long time? Or oh no, 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 no. You come like all all immigrants. They come for one year, and, and after a year they say, okay, well, I'll stay another year <laughs> and another year. And here it's you know, 55 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> And how did you find your way to the Pratt Institute? Because you, you retired there in, what, 2003, was it? Yeah, yeah. So you had a very long career yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. It was quite interesting. When I came here, I was um, meeting a, a student that came to our school on a Fulbright. And we sort of hatched plans. Oh, I, I, we should come over to the States. So I, I sort of decided I'd take the jump and come over to the States. So I first was in Vermont for about a summer and worked in this incredible uh, print shop, which was uh, a printing press and a, and a publisher. And it was in the woods 50 miles south of the Canadian border, and I couldn't figure out what these people were doing. They had clients like the Frick and the Metropolitan, the Dartmouth College, and I said, how do they get these clients? But I found out later, he was one of the top typographers in the country. And his name was Rocky Steinhauer, and he and his brother, they had started this printing business in a chicken coop. And there were like 20 people were sort of working and dead people. Like there was one guy who was a, a, a proofreader. He was from Harvard. He was a doctor in Greek philosophy. You know, I said, this is <laughs> unusual. And so the, the whole shock I experienced being up in this little town. And then I remember the first event was a 4th of July party. And they had like the real characters come out of the woods, you know. And, and I said, this is, this is, this is crazy. You know? <laughs> So this was the flight to the country right, uh, right, part right. of the time, Vermont being... And I remember there was one event that, that I, I still for, that can't forget. There was a, we, were in, we were invited, naturally, because I was a foreigner, and, and so I was sort of treated. You know, and uh, we went to a lady's party, and she talked about she had pigeons on the roof. And, and I said, oh, that's okay. But she didn't like that they made, you know, mess, messed up her roof. She said, I got them drunk and I had them shot, you know. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> dear, this, dear. Is, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you make, I know your son went to Dartmouth. Did you make your way to Dartmouth College at that time? Right. Uh, this, this Rocky Steinhauer, he took me to Dartmouth and it was like a, a, an incredible revelation. I had gone through a school that was partially bombed out still. And, and here's Dartmouth has this fantastic campus and, you know, we went there in the summer and, and people were, you know, rowing on the river and, and I said, this is a school? You know, <laughs> it's like a summer paradise. So it was, it was quite, quite a, a shock, you know, in, in many ways too. And interesting enough, but I made a connection to, um, to Pratt because they used the same service that's, that Rocky offered. And I was hired to do a, set up a program at Pratt. And, that's how I started and stayed there for 40 years. <laughs> so you had a particular skill, however, you, you had had this apprenticeship, so it's probably a rare enough thing to say, come set up a shop at your age. Right, right, because, see, uh, it was uh, my training as a typographer and my art background 
uh, made it perfect. And, and we set up a book arts program at, at, uh, at Pratt, and they needed a strong typography component. So I was 23, and they hired me. And, and uh, so by 28, I had tenure and was full professor. <laughs> So just, that's fabulous. Describe to me the evolution of your artistic practice. I mean, looking back on it, you know, is completely different from the sequence forward because, yeah, yeah. you know, one sees the evolution in retrospect, but at the time one moves gradually from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. Talk sort of forward uh, from, from then. What way did your practice develop? Well, I initially was very uh, sort of, still attached to the typographic language that was part of my early work. And I did a couple of projects that uh, but used mostly for teaching purposes. And then I, I discovered that there's, a, there's something I would like to follow. And I, I did a couple of books. And then uh, one of the particular books uh, was a very strong uh, influence by the currents at the time. There was a, a, a kind of beginning of awareness, um, mostly uh, articulated by McLuhan in his uh, Gutenberg Galaxy and his, his whole talking about that we are leaving one kind of system of communication, entering another one. And that <clears throat> sort of intrigued me very much because I, I understood what he was talking about. So I, I did this book and, and it, I, it was kind of a fluke that it, it happened, you know, that it was kind of the end of that era and I took the last kind of um, look at that and projected it what it could what it might you know enter into, and it, it's called Libro Mobile. It's book part of the exhibit, and uh, it is still very current when I look at it today. It's 50 years old, and and uh, and then from there I went into um, sort of exploring uh, the idea of print a lot and found objects in print. So I, I did a lot of combination of collage elements that stuck in prints. And from there, I, I actually, uh, I always was intrigued by illusion of sculpture and sculptural elements in prints. And from there, I basically explored uh, some sculptural concepts. And I did a couple of outdoor pieces, and they got bigger and bigger, and, and uh, it worked in us. <laughs> it was quite interesting. I sort of left paper alone for a little while, and then I came back to paper in combination with sculpture and I started layering, you know, 10, 15, 20, 40 sheets of paper on, on a print and threaded material through it. So it, it's a print sculpture, so to speak. And then that led to the sculptural collage. And, and uh, so, so it's, it's sort of a logical step when you sort of look at it. But at the time, I, I didn't know what, what I was heading at. So you mentioned uh, the Gutenberg galaxy. Marshall McLuhan was mm -hmm. very much a prophet, it seems, today. Um, he was talking about the world of TV and mm -hmm. the idea of the global village and the medium is the message. But he, he envisaged a world of screens in right. which we live in today. Your own work, I think, probably more than most artists I've ever seen, has engaged that 50-year move to the world of screens but by constantly commenting on it with objects, which in a sense throw humor at it, throw um, very serious consideration at it, but understand that it's, it's rather wry and therefore perhaps Dada-esque. Uh, well, I, I think my, my work is very much inspired by the, by the element of change, you know, that, that we go through and we experience, you know, in, in past and constantly forward, going forward, there's always going to be a change. And uh, so what I'm doing in my um, output, I, I make kind of commentary about uh, sort of different parts of that environment. And I use mechanical parts and I project them against sort of very unusual uh, organic things and, and quote uh, many times verbally, you know, with, with kind of ironic references to wordplay. And, and that sort of uh, sets up a stage to, to uh, sort of examine what we're really, you know, facing in terms of a, a future communication, a future exp me means of expression, you know, that, that comes. And um, it, it's, um, I, I find it uh, com comes just out of curiosity, you know, I, I have to do that.
Mm. But going back to the idea of the apprenticeship and learning the craft, um, which ultimately parts of it would become obsolete, mm -hmm. um, and then seeing the development of the communications revolution, and there've only been three in history, but you've not only lived through it like everybody else, you've actually engaged with its predecessor of right. a long time. <laughs> so that sort of commentary, I think, is deeply profound. It makes me wonder, I mean, are you an early adapter to technology? Did you use a computer quickly? Did you use an iPhone quickly? No, 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 I'm, I'm just the opposite. <laughs> I'm like, like a, an orphan when it comes to this stuff. Uh, in fact, I, I, I just thought the other day, I, I literally grew up without a telephone. You know, the first telephone we had was on the street, on the block. And if you wanted to make a phone, you had to go to that particular household and make an, uh, an appointment, say, I may need to make a call. And today, I, I have a cell phone. I, I never use it. <laughs> I carry it with me, but I never use it. You know? So I'm still kind of an, an odd uh, duck in that, in that field. And my computer uh, adaptability is not very good. You know? So I, I just can read an email and get a few things going. But... Uh, it is it is fascinating how quickly this thing has moved and how rapidly you know this development happens. Every three years, you can throw your computer out and get a new one because the old one is too slow or it doesn't do this, and and it's it's uh, it just keeps keeps us on on our toes, you know, to keep looking and looking and looking. But some artists have uh, used drawings mm -hmm. as you would have to note and help to create your objects and then move to, for example, computer-aided design. Did you ever do that? Not, no, I haven't. You know, I, I find I, I'm somewhat maybe still suspicious of it in some ways, you know, and because I, I look at it and, and take, a, take a little test and then go back and then do my thing and find, very find myself very secure in my environment. And then I maybe make another approach and say, uh, maybe I should try that, but I, I never really have been comfortable with it to that degree. You know? So it's, it's an interesting uh, kind of juxtaposition I am seeing it. To some extent, um, you know, obviously we, we're all humans and we've always had our humanity. So presumably you know, our intelligence level, whether it increases or not, is, is well, debatable, let's say. <laughs> but recently a friend introduced me to medieval carpentry drawings right through to 19th century carpentry drawings and looking at them they seem every bit as complex as anything that would come out of a computer mm -hmm. to what extent did you look at the the brilliance of people in the past without the aid of computers uh well i think just studying history and and reading you know uh old drawings and 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 going through old masters you know you you find like uh and in particular for instance i was always intrigued by the idea of multiplying things of printmaking and when you when you study some of the complexity of some of the early engravings and how they could do this optical illusions on on, on metal plates or on, on wood engravings I, I i just still am, am, am impressed you know of, of, of the ability of what these people managed to do and when you look at, at uh, a, a woodcut by a duro or you look like at a steel engraving in the 17th 18th century where they did, i mean it's just Fascinating. I can't. I can't fathom how they could have the patience and the discipline to do that. And it's. It's. It is a, a, a very um, a fascinating kind of uh, corner, you know. But and I, I'm. I, as I said, I am very intrigued by the concept of duplicating things, of making them available in a larger quantity, and the print is the natural. Uh, uh, venue for that, there's no question. But anybody seeing you unbox one of your works and then unfold it and then ultimately put it back together again and put it back in the box is <laughs> totally bewildered by the, the magician at work. I mean, there's a wizardry to, first of all, imagining how you would conceive such a thing, make such a thing, know how to play with such a thing. And so to what extent is that sort of at the part of your, if you like, your gameplay with, the, with people? Well, I think it's it's the the idea of surprise, and and as you said, there's there's a, a kind of a magic if you have a, a box and you can open it, unfold it, and go from the flat surface into a dimensional surface, and have it really its own world, you know. And then, like like a magician, you say clack, and it comes back together, you know, it falls <laughs> back into the box, you know. And I think the the I, I call them their boxes, but they're books in in many ways, and and. Uh, that, that's a challenge to do that, you know, to, to find. And I find in, in looking at where the book is heading, to me, this is one of the directions. The book is, is 
being challenged by, by the technology that we were talking about a little earlier. And so, so the book needs a different uh, venue, needs a different track, you know, to stay alive and to become a vital part in, in people's activity. And reading isn't just reading text, reading is visual forms, there's a literacy in, 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 in uh, play of, of uh, interaction of shapes and so on. And that's what I do with my books, you know, there's a sense of timing, a sense of, you know, color, a sense of uh, interaction that, that is quite, quite uh, part of what I call reading, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the basic elements of art and the principles of design must have been inherent to your, your initial formation as an artist in, in school. I guess uh, there must there must be you know part of, of and, and I remember when uh, as a child I was I was always uh, intrigued by the visual and I, I had uh, I, I didn't have paper I had uh, a slate board you know a little you know like we had them in school and that, uh, we took it home and I did drawings galore over and over and you know it was nice you could just wipe them off and do a new one wipe it off do a new one you didn't waste paper you didn't have paper so <laughs> And I, I found it fascinating, you know, the, the idea of something coming out of you and then you see it taking shape and then say, wow, this is something and, uh, that has stayed with me you know, all, all my life. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you see your works as signs and to what extent do you see them as symbols? Uh, I think there are more, I, I would say, a combination of both, you know. Uh, the sign is, is really sort of hitting, you know, signaling some, some uh, purpose for a, a, a medium that is really sort of looking mostly backward. And uh, the, the, the symbol is essentially, uh, again, uh, how, we, how we take it, you know, from, from uh, the historical perspective, you know, what, what can we make with this new uh, gadget, uh, artist book, you know. And, uh, or the book object as such, you know, so they become a symbolic uh, element of, of change, you know, in many ways. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, the early part of the 20th century with um, Einstein and Freud and, you know, so many extraordinary people who deconstructed and helped us to reconstruct a mm -hmm. new possibility for our world, they, um, they were part of a world that gave us movements, I mentioned earlier, like, like Dada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To what extent, um, has uh, have those movements influenced you, and and particularly the um, importance of artists working in Germany at that time? Well, Dada has been a very powerful influence in, in my my work, uh, uh, particular you know because they they sort of uh, did a lot of deconstructing you know they they they, they deconstructed the whole concept of art you know and, and uh, so I, I've been from from early on when I had a sort of a an understanding of of the interconnections of art and, and, and life and society. I, I was fascinated what these people were doing and, and uh, it had um, kind of a, a strong, you know, a sense of, of respecting what they were doing, particularly in, in view of what what happened in my, in, in, the, in my country, in the society where they were basically just outlawed and they couldn't work. And so I, I, when I went back to, to art school, which, which we talked earlier about, there was sort of the beginning of a new uh, sort of reassessing where is the German art movement, what happened, because the Bauhaus had been, you know, blown out of, 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 the, of existence and had reassembled in the States and in different countries. So, uh, there was a, a need to really take stock and say, you know, where, where do we go from here? And, and uh, so initially there was a, a kind of a, some return to, to their home country. Others, they say, no, we, we don't go back. So it was a, a kind of a period of maybe five, ten years before Germany found its own voice again. And, and you know, it took into the early six, mid-60s and, and then it, it came back in a very strong, powerful way. Mm -hmm. In terms of seeing today the world as a world of screens, um, why I think your work is so powerful as, a, um, as a, a point of consideration about what's happened to in this communications revolution is that you constantly engage the um, circumstance of screens, which is that they are either pointing to reality mm -hmm. or to illusion. And oftentimes we don't know what's real and what's illusory. So in your own work, to what extent do you play with these notions? Oh, I, I do quite quite a lot, and I, I do a lot of uh, uh, drawings and, and constructions that play on this duality of reality and illusion. And 
uh, for instance, uh, there's a series of, of prints I've done, the, the, uh, the dimensional print constructions, uh, that are uh, actually taking uh, sort of stock of a very traditional uh, media, the, the etching, you know, where I draw, make drawings and they're etched into a plate and they, you, they have kind of a, a sense of, how should I put it, like a Rube Goldbergish reality, which is kind of paradox and doesn't work. And, it's, and against that, I play with a real space, with real elements of paper and color blocks that are coming out of the surface. And so when you look at these things, you, you sometimes think, is this real, is this not real? And, and so it's this illusion reality uh, has always fascinated me. And, and that's sort of interesting how it happens in the computer world, in the, in the internet world. You know. We, we get situations where, is, is this now reality or where, where are we going with this? And we don't really know. You know is, is it, I mean, we're we are starting making currency for the computer. We are having sort of a whole life. People have galleries. People have a, a, a kind of concepts of existence in the, in, the, in the internet space. And you sometimes have to pinch yourself. Say, is, this, is this going to be like that? Or? And another aspect of contemporary life is that we with the growth of the population of the world and growing materialism, mm -hmm. we have a superfluity of, of product. And so we have to be sustainable. And in your own work, constantly you have used the new, but you've also constantly used the old. I mean, I'm thinking of, for example, computer boards or pieces right. of paper that you might have lying around. Sure, sure. Well, I'm, I've, I've been, because of the, of the um, kind of experience growing up during a wartime, I threw never anything away. So a piece of paper uh, was always a very uh, inhibiting thing, a, a fresh piece of paper I was always inhibited by touching it and, and working with it. So whenever you, you have something that's used, I keep it and re re recycle it. Uh, the machine parts, they always have fascinated because, you know, machines always have influenced that. When you think of the 19th century, late 19th century, 20th century, I mean, how our life was changed by technology. We're going through the same thing now with life changing through uh, the internet, through electronics. Uh, and so we, we're facing this challenge from outside to sort of um, confuse us in terms of what is organic, what is real, what, is, what, what have we become, you know, in terms of are we half machine, half men, or are we half computer, half this. So there, there's a, a kind of a, uh, a flux that we, we experience every day, you know, and, and um, so I'm, I'm using parts of each of the environments and, and play with it. And, and uh, so that's how some of the collages and things come about, yeah. If we were to think about the artist as commentator, how would you complete the sentence, my work comments on? Uh, life in a technological world, life in an electronic world, uh, because we are, we are constantly having to, re to reassess, you know, what are the, our uh, really purposes in, 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 in this life, on this planet, you know, what, what are we doing, you know. And there's, um, it's interesting when, when you really look at the um, uh, interconnectivity uh, through the, through the uh, internet and so on. Uh, at the same time, we're noticing an isolation in some ways, you know, like everybody's connected to everybody, but everybody's more alone, you know. And, and what, I, what I find very ironic, for instance, the, the use of the telephone, the younger generation, they don't make telephone calls, they text, because the element of surprise is taken out. So when you make a phone call, there's the reaction to another person's voice and the, the sort of immediateness of having to respond to a comment in a text doesn't exist. You put it down, out, comes back. And so there's a kind of, a, again, more of an isolation that, that I find happens here. There's been a lot of discussion about, you know, we live in a world of, of well, you can look at it different ways, word and image, mm -hmm. or we live in a world of images which includes words. Mm -hmm. To which would you lean? I would say it's a world of images that includes words, because increasingly everything is image run, it's visual, you know, everything has to be visual motion, because uh, it's like um, you don't need the brain to translate it, you know, it's, it's sort of easier to uh, access and I think that's in a sense a shame because we need to keep our marbles sharp you know, to, to do uh, uh, watching, you know, what, what is happening. You know. 
and I think that's that's uh, part of the part of the environment today. I mean, you've always been prolific, so you're going to continue making work for as long as you live, I should imagine. Oh, so, I, I, so, so looking forward, what's the impact of this growth of images? Do you think? I, I don't really know, but I, I, I'm curious. I'm always curious now what's what's around the next corner. So, so I, I, I can't predict, but I will. I know I will always work. It's it's a it's a necessity, you know. I mean, uh, I'm in my studio every day. And if I just walk through or open a drawer and look at it and, and produce or, or do new things, it's, it's, it, it can't really always predict. But I have to be in that environment and I have to be uh, sort of looking into myself and, and listening to what's coming and, and react to it, you know, and that's, that's mm -hmm. how it happens. So, so having spent a, a long career engaging with the world of images, the catalog for our exhibition is electronic. What are your thoughts on this? I, I find it very fascinating. In fact, I'm very thrilled that it's happened because me, myself, I'm not a, an electronic person. So, you know, that it's kind of ironic that I'm the person who looks in a way backward in technology and so on gets into this futuristic uh, arena with a catalog. And I think it's, it's terrific. I find, I find it totally, totally appropriate you know, to do it that way. Yeah. And a lot of different possibilities from you know, making video and film yeah. to being able to show you at work in your studio and then to have the usual catalog essays and the like. No, it's, I, I, I find it uh, totally uh, uh, a, a great experiment for myself, you know, and, and, and maybe it sets up a, a kind of a, a new direction for making books on, 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 on the right. electronic. Yeah. That's what I'm wondering, will yeah. Werner Pfeiffer make a digital <laughs> publication? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, who knows? <laughs> I, I'm not there yet. Well, thank you very much for this conversation. <laughs>